reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. My beloved, obedient as you have always been, not only when I am present, but all the more now when I am absent, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For God is the one who, for his good purpose, works in you both to desire and to work. Do everything without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine like lights in the world, as you hold on to the word of life, so that my boast for the day of Christ may be that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. But even if I am poured out as a libation, upon the sacrificial service of your faith. I rejoice and share my joy with all of you. In the same way, you also should rejoice and share your joy with me. Verbum Domini. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is my life's refuge. Of whom should I be afraid? The Lord is my life and my salvation. One thing I ask of the Lord, this I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may gaze on the loveliness of the Lord and contemplate his temple. I believe that I shall see the bounty of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord with courage. Be stout-hearted and wait for the Lord. Dominus Vobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucum, Great crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and addressed them. If anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you wishing to construct a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there is enough for its completion? Otherwise, after laying the foundation and finding himself unable to finish the work, 
the onlookers should laugh at him and say, this one began to build, but did not have the resources to finish. Or what king marching into battle would not first sit down and decide whether with 10,000 troops he can successfully oppose another king advancing upon him with 20,000 troops? But if not, while he is still far away, he will send a delegation to ask for peace terms. In the same way, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Verbum Domini. In the tumultuous times that we live, where our faith as Christians is questioned, doubted, and often comes under attack, and indeed where those of other God-filled faith also suffer persecution. The following passages seem very apropos. In these most troublesome times, the church is beset by enemies on every side, and is weighed down by calamities so heavy that ungodly men assert that the gates of hell have at length prevailed against her. And further, another passage. You know the times in which we live. They are scarcely less deplorable for the Christian religion than the worst days, which in time past were most full of misery to the church. We see faith, the root of all Christian virtues, lessening in many souls. We see charity growing cold the young generation daily growing in depravity of morals and views, the church of Jesus Christ attacked on every side by open force or by craft, a relentless war waged against the sovereign pontiff, and the very foundations of religion undermined with a boldness which waxes daily in intensity. These things are indeed so much a matter of notoriety that it is needless for us to expound on the depths to which society has been sunk in these days, or on the designs which now agitate the minds of men. These passages seem to sum up in many ways our current state, the current conditions in which we live. But the first passage is from a decree issued by blessed Pope Pius IX on December 8, 1870. And the second passage is from an encyclical of Pope Leo XIII issued on August 15, 1889. My friends, our church has been under attack before. It has suffered persecution previously. But as Jesus said, upon this rock, my church will be built and the forces of the netherworld will not prevail against it. But in 1870, during the reign of Pope Pius IX, there was much violence against the Catholic Church. The Franco-Prussian War was raging on. The Italian governments wanted to take over Rome, which had always been under the Pope's authority and King Victor Emmanuel of Italy waged open war against Pope Pius IX, and the anti-clerical newspapers of the day applauded the taking over of the Papal States. And the conditions in 1889, as conveyed by Pope Leo XIII, were not much better, such that the Pope Leo observed in his encyclical, in circumstances so unhappy and troublous, Human remedies are insufficient, and it becomes necessary to beg for assistance from the divine power. Of course, the divine power is always our Lord Jesus Christ. The divine power has manifested to her as our Blessed Virgin Mary, but the divine power, as referenced by these popes, was the protection and the intercession of Saint Joseph. 
Pope Pius' 1870 decree invokes St. Joseph as the patron of our universal Catholic Church. And as Pope Leo conveyed in his encyclical, that God may be more favorable to our prayers, and that he may come with bounty and promptitude to the aid of his church, we judge it of deep utility for the Christian people continually to invoke with great piety and trust, together with the Virgin Mother of God, her chaste spouse, the Blessed Joseph. And we regard it as the most certain that this will be most pleasing to the Virgin herself. We always call upon the Blessed Virgin to receive us and to protect us, to lead us to the grace of God and to convey upon her the blessings that so granted to her by our Lord Jesus Christ. But as we celebrate today this votive mass of we also petition this most phenomenal and humble saint, the protector of the Holy Family, the patron of our universal Catholic Church, to strengthen us, to guide us through this most powerful example as a faithful disciple of Christ, to be with us always during our personal times of trouble and during the times of trouble experienced internally or externally to our church. For St. Joseph, a man of humble heart, filled with the love of God and the love for his family, Mary and Jesus, he feels perfectly what St. Paul beckons in his letter to the Philippians when St. Paul states, do everything without grumbling or questioning that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine like lights in the world. Saint Joseph is that silent strength, a shining beacon of light, just slightly in the shadow of the Blessed Virgin that conveys to us an exemplary model to guide us within our lives and within our faith. Again, as Pope Leo conveyed, in truth, the dignity of the mother of God is so lofty that no one created can rank above it. But as Joseph has been united to the Blessed Virgin by the ties of marriage, it may not be doubted that he approached nearer than any to the eminent dignity by which the mother of God surpasses so nobly all created natures. As now we move from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, St. Joseph stays with us in spirit as we join the multitude within St. Luke's Gospel, who is traveling with Jesus. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, where he will die on the cross. And Jesus turns to us and conveys what seems to be a very harsh message, to be his disciple. We must hate our parents, our children, our siblings. We must hate even our own lives. This seems to be a contradiction to what Jesus teaches elsewhere as recorded in the Gospels. But Jesus is conveying a reality, a reality to gain eternal life, that in all that we are, all that we do, all that we desire, all that we possess, all of it stands behind the greatest and first of Jesus' commandments, to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, and with all of our minds. And Jesus is confronting us in St. Luke's Gospel to consider, consider the cost of discipleship to live and abide by this greatest commandment. He's being straightforward. He's being honest. He's being transparent as to what it will take. He's not promising that it's going to be easy. We must be willing to bear our crosses, whatever they may be, to follow him. He is calling us to not be timid or half-hearted in our response, but to be bold, to be brave, 
Should anyone or anything be an obstruction in our love for him, this may require some very, very difficult choices at times. But this means we need to put aside whatever may be inhibiting us to recognize completely and fully and accept and embrace that God must take priority over everything within our lives. It is not to love our families less, but to love more deeply, to love more richly, to live our lives in love of him who gave himself to the cross for our salvation. And through that love, fulfill the second great commandment, to love others as we love ourselves, to honor and to love our parents, to honor and love our families, to express love and action and deeds to all for our first love of him. For many of us, perhaps all of us, this will be a tough journey, one that we must keep always in mind, this commitment, and to always be ready. This emphasizes the point not only of readiness to meet our Lord, but also the preparation, the cost of doing so, and answering totally yes, yes, Lord, to his call to discipleship. Jesus wants us all in. Not that we will say, Lord, I'll be your disciple. But first, I need to pursue this career. First, I need to pursue this relationship. Or first, I need to pursue this particular pleasure. After all, that, I'll follow you completely. But maybe tomorrow. Maybe the next day. Maybe next year. Maybe when I'm older. If we ponder such thoughts, we realize there is no other time. The time is now. We cannot or should not put true discipleship to Jesus on a hanger, to be taken off and worn when it's convenient to us, and to realize that, if necessary, we are ready, we are willing to abandon everything within our temporal world for Christ and living within his commandments, detaching from all that we may have for the sake of his glory, provides us then the freedom to express ourselves to our fullest capability in imitation of him, practicing the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, all for the love of him. This is exactly what St. Joseph did as he silently and competently protected the Holy Family. He silently and comp competently protected and nurtured and supported them without consideration of the cost to him. He supported the first church, the Holy Family, thus being the most preeminent saint after the Blessed Virgin. He and the Blessed Virgin is our refuge to whom we can turn and ask for guidance and help. So Jesus instructs us today, my brothers and sisters, that when we are clear about what God wants us to do, what he is commissioning and calling us forth to achieve in his name, like St. Joseph, despite the storms that may swirl around us, we should not sit within the enclaves of our physical, our spiritual homes, pondering and planning, but to act, to act upon what we are called to do in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as we call upon St. Joseph and plead for his intercession on our behalf and on behalf of our Holy Catholic Church, we pray as conveyed by Pope Leo at the end of his 1989 encyclical. To you, O blessed Joseph, we have recourse in our affliction in having implored the help of your holy spouse. We now, with hearts filled with confidence, earnestly beg you to take us under your protection. By that charity that united you to the Immaculate Virgin Mother of God, and by that fatherly love with which you cherished the child Jesus, we beseech you and we humbly pray that you will look down with gracious eyes upon that inheritance which Jesus Christ purchased by his blood, 
and will assist us in our need by your power and strength. Defend, O oh most watchful guardian of the Holy Family. Keep from us, O oh most loving Father, all blight of error and corruption. Aid us from on high, most valiant defender, in this conflict with the powers of darkness. Shield us ever under your patronage. In following your example and strengthened by your help, we may live a holy life, die a happy death, and attain to everlasting bliss in heaven. Amen. <laughs>